Hello, and welcome to the weekly seminar of the Living Earth Collaborative and Washington University in St. Louis's Evolution, Ecology, and Population Biology Group. Our second speaker is James Lucas, and James Lucas is also currently a PhD candidate in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology program at Washington University under the mentorship of Dr. Robbie Hart. Uh, during his undergraduate studies at Colby College, James completed a double major in biology and environmental science with concentrations in ecology and evolution and conservation biology respectively, and he minored in chemistry. He also participated in field courses in Costa Rica through the Organization for Tropical Studies and in Madagascar through the School of International Training. Throughout these studies, James has garnered an impressive list of awards, including the Richard Evan Schultz's Award by the Society for Economic Botany and the Newman Exploration Grant. James has conducted field research in the islands of Saipan, Rota, and Guam, in Madagascar, and in the subalpine meadows of Mount Rainier. James also prioritizes science outreach as a co-host of St. Louis Science Distilled and as a mentor for the Young Scientist Program here in St. Louis. And finally, um, I asked James what his favorite plant was, and he said that it was the pawpaw. And to explain this, he says, I'm stuck in Missouri, but I belong in the tropics. So on that note, please help me welcome James Lucas as he asks, does eco ecological niche modeling look good on paper? Applying methods in global change biology to an ethnobotanical system. Take it away, James. Uh, thanks for that uh, very comprehensive introduction, uh, Sasha. Uh, thanks again to the LEC fellows for hosting this. And uh, thanks, Justin, for a really exciting talk before me. Uh, I'm going to continue the theme of uh, ecology and biogeography in my talk. But before I get into that, I want to start with a question that many of us have asked ourselves and our friends. Why are we here? Uh, seems like a fairly frustrating question, um, but we've all asked this to ourselves at some point. Um, my friends have asked me, uh, they asked me why I'm here, and I'm a pretty sarcastic grad student, and my, might say, well, I drove here. They might ask again and say, well, why are you here in Missouri? And I would say, well, Antarctica is pretty cold. Well, why are you here in St. Louis doing a PhD in botany? And I'd say, well, I can't compete in pre-med and I work well with other botanists. And then they get flustered and the, the friend says, well, why is anything here? Why say is this tree here? Now that is a real philosophical question. So how would you go about answering that? Well, maybe you can uncover patterns in where the tree exists and where it doesn't and you might go about doing that. You'll go into the field, find the tree, and then mark where it is with the dot on a map. Maybe you'll do that again and put another dot. Do that two more times uh, for a total of four dots. And then, for example, say you find this tree in 12 places all scattered across uh, North America. And then you find out, well, over time, four of those trees don't persist. So, you have your data, right? And you have a lot of spaces in between those points. So if you have more time, uh, more effort, more field technicians to collect more samples, you might be able to fill in the spaces in between those points and then get a map that looks something like this, right? But because ecology uh, is often funds limited, uh, you might have to use interpolation to make a probability estimate that the tree occurs uh, in between those points. So given that the plant or the tree exists um, probably in this range, we can say that the plant has the capacity to move uh, to this particular range across North America. But there's also an ecological framework that can help us understand why this, why this tree exists here and not elsewhere. Um, and that uh, posits that abiotic factors also play a role in dictating where this tree might exist. And so you can see in this purplish blue, this might be the set of areas on North America where this tree may exist, but 
uh, in areas where it does not overlap with the area in red, uh, you can see that it is limited in its movement. It's not able to access those regions that are in purple, but not also in red. On top of this, there are also biotic constraints. Uh, competition with other plants uh, can limit or even uh, facilitate the existence or coexistence of this tree with other living organisms. And so what we see is that we can actually construct a range map for this tree, uh, which is indicated in gray. Um, and so that, that area in gray does not include uh, those individuals that are unable to persist because they lie outside the range of pseudopole uh, abiotic and biotic factors. So to answer the question, why is this tree here? We have a convenient ecological framework um, and an ecological space. The nexus of abiotic factors, biotic factors, and movement can dictate where this plant might exist. And so we might call this a niche. Uh, really conveniently, even the sarcastic existential grad student uh, is subject to the same ecological constraints. But I digress. So when we use the interpolation, we can look at it uh, as two sides of the same coin. If we're more concerned, and this is a little bit simplified, but um, for the ease of understanding, if we're more concerned about the geographic, geographic spread of this tree uh, over the planet, we can consider it species distribution modeling as our form of interpolation. If we're more concerned with the abstract uh, in environmental space where this tree might be able to occur, we might call this ecological niche modeling. So, there are many examples where ecological niche modeling or species distribution modeling might um, be useful in practice. So in ecology, often this is done to model how um, different organisms, whether it's an endangered uh, conifer or whether it's uh, economically important crops like uh, grapevines uh, might shift their geographic ranges with climate change. We can also see this uh, in a human geography context. And so what these models really do is they take a suite of environmental inputs and uh, produce a probability uh, for an outcome. And so we can take env uh, environmental inputs uh, to predict flood extent during a natural disaster or use environmental inputs to estimate where's the best place to put emergency helicopter landing pads. Um, and there is some crossover in a few case studies where there are elements of both that are that appear in uh, these case studies. But for the most part, we still don't see uh, simultaneous uh, evaluation of both ecological and human geography um, principles uh, in tandem in a species distribution or ecological niche model. So I hope I've convinced you that this looks useful in practice, but now is the time where I tell you it looks good on paper, or I hope to convince you of that. So. Paper is a very versatile um, product that's been in use for over two millennia. We use it to write on, we use it for money, and we use it for art, right? But that paper has to come from somewhere. And where it is made traditionally by hand, uh, it comes from very specific plants that people have chosen and used for centuries, if not millennia. And so, to facilitate these transformations from plant to paper to product, people are involved. And so this seems like a really useful case study for examining the integration of ecology and human geography. So uh, in the scope of this talk today, uh, I'm really only focusing on the first particular steps. So where to really examine this? 
So my focus is on Nepal, which is a culturally and uh, ecologically diverse area in the Himalaya. Um, they've been making paper there for at least 1600 years. Um, and they still do this by hand because government documents are required by law to be made on Nepalese paper, which is also called Lopta. They also have about 600 uh, cottage industries throughout the country that still manufacture this paper and supply it for domestic use as well as for export. So although the paper is called Lopta, there's a little bit of confusion in that three different species are used to make it. So these include Kalo Lopta, Seto Lopta, and Argali. Um, and each of these, as you will see, have slightly different um, environmental preferences for their growth. So if we want to make uh, an environmental niche model using these species, we have to get um, latitude and longitude points. And so these can be obtained from herbarium specimens, uh, from databases like GBIF, and from um, community science platforms like iNaturalist. So when we plot all these occurrences on a map, we get something that looks like this, and these are shown with red dots. Then we can obtain our environmental data from databases like World Clim and extract a suite of climate points uh, from these specific lat long coordinates. Um, the ones that I'm concerned with here are uh, dealing with temperature and precipitation, um, but I'm not going to get into the very technical details of this. But uh, the algorithm that I use to uh, generate these models is called MaxEnt. And what MaxEnt does is it generates a statistical comparison of the climate data from these points in red and compares it to what is effectively a null model of randomly sam sampled background points. Um, and these points themselves also have uh, climate data that is extracted from them using this uh, WorldClim database. And so when you run Maxent, you get the following uh, distribution. Uh, and you can see that it produces a habitat suitability uh, map where places in green seem to indicate climates with the most favorable suitability for looked at a grow. And regions that are in gray or red have poor to no suitability for looked at a grow. In fact, we can do this for all three species, and we can see that all three species seem to have a slightly different climatic niche, knowing the topography of Nepal with the Himalaya uh, towards the north bordering with Tibet. Uh, it's very high and very cold up there, and so all three of these species don't um, fare very well in the icier, higher climes. In the same way, um, further south, the climate is, is hot, uh, wet, and tropical. Uh, and this is also unsuitable for either of these three species to persist well. One thing to note is Argali. Uh, Argali is a species that you really find only in eastern Nepal. Um, and so the distribution model shown here uh, reflects that. Okay, so now I'm going to focus on the human geography component. So to show you what the paper making uh, process looks like. Um, I'm going to show you a quick video uh, from a field season I had in Nepal in 2018. So this gentleman is showing a large branch of argali that he has harvested, and he's cutting off the smaller branches. So after the smaller branches are cut off. He uses a steel cup to scrape away the outer bark. And that allows access to the very fibrous inner bark. And so these long, very strong fibers, which peel away uh, entirely from the wood, are what are used in the paper. So from there, the fibers are dried in the sun and then transported to the actual paper makers. The paper makers get the dried bark, soak it in water um, to loosen them up and then cook the fiber uh, in a lye solution or a sodium carbonate solution, which will help the fibers separate from one another. 
after the fibers are cooked, um, she washes them again and then further facilitates the separation of the fibers from one another through manual beating. After the beating and the fibers have become fully separated, uh, the fibers are then put back into water and you get the suspension, this very thick suspension of fiber. So then what the paper maker will do is she will take a frame. It's usually just simple two by four, two by fours that form a square or a rectangle and then mosquito netting that is stretched on one side of it. She then pours the fiber into the frame, and now she takes pieces of bark from a tree called chiple to extract a mucilage. And what this mucilage does is it helps distribute the fibers evenly across the, fr the frame uh, before all the water drains from it. Once the fibers are dispersed evenly along the sheet, she raises the frame to drain the water there's a very thin layer of argly paper on that frame. And then she puts it to the side and then it will dry in the sun. And once it's dry, she goes ahead and peels those thin sheets of argly paper off the frame. Okay, so to build a model for the human geography component, um, you have to go about this a little bit differently because GBIF uh, and other databases and herbaria really only focus on living uh, species or living matter. And so you have to be a little bit more creative to get your locations. So what I did is I went to YouTube, I posted a bunch of Facebook comments, sent Facebook messages, poured over the uh, literature in uh, small publications that concerned Nepal, um, reading articles in Kathmandu Post, Google translating articles that I can't read in Nepalese. Uh, and what you'll find is all of these actually have two within about two or three kilometers, if not one kilometer square, um, of specific villages that are found on Nepal. And using databases like um, GeoNames, you're able to obtain lat long coordinates for these places. You can even find them on Google Maps. And even more interesting is if you remember, the frames are set out in the sun. If you array these all along a, a rice field, you can actually see them from space and obtain coordinates here. So combining all of these crowdsources, crowdsource locations together, you can get a set of points of known hand paper making industries across Nepal. Um, this is a still ongoing project um, obtaining help from collaborators. Uh, these are Bikram Gyawale, who has since graduated and got his master's degree, um, and Ashish Dami, who is still a master's student. And both of these uh, collaborators are helping obtain more points, uh, revise and confirm their accuracies, uh, and build the models that we're making together. I also want to remind you that from the video, you could have seen a lot of interesting environmental uh, aspects. One is that you need a lot of water to be able to make these sheets. Uh, you need to rinse the fiber and you need to use uh, water to be able to form each sheet. So precipitation, proximity to rivers might be important predictors. Proximity to roads is also important because you have to be able to get your paper to uh, urban areas for selling and for the manufacture of notebooks and lampshades and things like that. You also need adequate sunlight to be able to dry the paper. And so temperature uh, as well as uh, solar radiation might be important predictors. And lastly, you have to be able to have the raw materials to be able to make your paper. So in this image, you actually can see uh, 
argali bushes growing on the roadside uh, right by this person who's carrying a sheaf of, of paper to be sold. And so if you take all of these predictors together, you can make a species distribution model for uh, hand paper making industries as well. And you can see that just like the raw materials, uh, these industries tend to exist at middling elevations, uh, not too high up in elevation near the Tibetan border and not too uh, low in elevation near the, the Indian border. What's really exciting is that uh, World Klim also has access to projected environmental um, data in the years 2050 and 2070. And so you can show how habitat suitability for um, Kalolokta, Setulokta, and Argali might change over the this century. And you can see that uh, we might predict that rain shifts might be necessary uh, for um, production of Lokta paper to persist in Nepal. Uh, and similarly, we might expect the same for the hand paper making industries themselves. Um, we can see that uh, as Eastern Nepal gets a little bit wetter uh, from climate projections, um, we can see that places further west might become more suitable for hand paper making to continue, um, as well as areas that are higher in elevation closer to the Tibet border. And so given these interesting gifts and maps, um, what are the next steps to do? So model refinement is one thing, uh, would be lovely to get more data points from uh, other herbaria, um, also from other paper making industries that we're hoping to contact. Um, so there's bias correction, uh, certainly uh, people tend to go along well-traveled paths across Nepal because the terrain is so rugged. And so you do have spatial autocorrelation where uh, popular treks uh, to uh, famous mountains like Everest and Kanchenjunga uh, are much more well sampled than more remote locations. Um, further model tuning is necessary. And then the co cross comparison of the Maxent algorithm that we used with other possible algorithms like um, GLMs. Um, these also have implications for management and conservation. So once all the analyses are done, then we need to make advice on where paper plants should be planted with uh, climate change in mind. Um, how should the harvesting practices uh, change for the benefit of the plants? And do we need to see paper making industries uh, relocate or even shift to use different raw materials. Will we need to have a stronger reliance on argali over lokta, or maybe even transition to what the Tibetans use. This is stellar kami jasmine, which is uh, used in Tibet. Um, probably the most salient uh, point that I would like to, to emphasize is that effective management and conservation of ethnobotanically important resources must target the steps and processes in tandem. And so I'm hoping that this study uh, will serve as a, a model for other uh, ethnobotanically uh, important resources and non-timber forest products, not just in Nepal, but uh, around the world. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, these people and these funding sources, uh, and I can take questions. Thank you. Thank you, James. That's that was just fantastic talk, really well done. Um, it's really interesting and I wanted to go to those places. Um, so we have a question here from John Birmingham and I actually had the same question. Um, we're both curious about um, the relationship between the plant that's needed to create the mucilage and the three species that you're studying. So for example, do you think that the um, distribution of those three species um, is in, are influenced by the distribution of that other species that's necessary to make the material spread across the mesh? Yeah, so that's uh, an interesting question. Thanks for asking. Um, so possibly, but I also, in, in talks with paper making industries in Southern Nepal, uh, a lot of them have been switching to a synthetic formation aid. Uh, so this would be polyethylene oxide um, and as chemical industries become more common and as globalization proceeds, uh, a lot of people are starting to use that 
um, but because of the cultural importance that is accorded Lokta paper, um, uh, people are less, uh, people are more reluctant to, to shift to using, say, industrial made paper uh, for, say, sacred religi religious rites or tankas or for calligraphy. Um, and so, given those specialized purposes, um, there's still a, a holdout uh, an economic, for economic survival of this plant, as well as hopefully the environmental uh, persistence of them. Fascinating talk. James, um, you have a lot of questions here in the chat. So there is one from Stephen Blake. He asked, does the price of the paper fluctuate? And what effect may this have on harvesting rates and sustainable use of this species, which may blow ecological distribution models out of the window? Yeah, that's a really important point. Um, so uh, as of right now, the economics of, of hand paper making seems to be unfortunately in decline. Um, I did mention like uh, industrial paper making, uh, it's simply ubiquitous. Uh, everyone uses toilet paper, tissues, napkins, things like that. Um, and they're single use and they can be mass produced. Um, and so to acknowledge that it hasn't had a drastic toll on paper making in recent history is, is, um, is not seeing the, whole, the, the full picture. Um, but Nepal, realizing the, the cultural importance of uh, the three Lokta species has encouraged uh, industries, cottage industries to continue making Lokta paper. Um, they mandate that their government documents are printed uh, with Lokta paper, but uh, in doing so, uh, there is the concern that people are harvesting too much. Um, and so these encouragements are not done with uh, ecological, environmental, um, and conservation-minded uh, focuses. And so uh, to go back to my penultimate slide, um, we need to really consider every step of the process. And so I can, through these models, uh, we can consider the um, environmental part of how this might affect plants and people, but uh, it also needs a more integrative approach to understand, well, do we need to change the way that we harvest um, and how might doing that uh, affect the populations and how they're managed over 20 years or 50 years. Thanks, James. Uh, it looks like we have time for one more question, um, but there are many other ones, so we'll be sure to save those and pass them along to you. Um, but the question is from Emily Wachewski, who asks, are the plants used for paper typically cultivated or wild collected? Yeah, that's also another important question. So in the framework that I was talking about, um, environmental filtering, um, a key player is also the movement of the species. And so uh, over the 1600 years that Lokta has been used or made, um, people have dispersed cuttings. Um, a lot of these cuttings will readily root. They have runners, um, they're, they're often clonal, uh, as well as the seeds of these plants. And so while I wouldn't say they're cultivated as they would intensively say bananas or wheat uh, here in the United States, um, they have been dispersed by people for a long time. And so with humans being the limiting agent to their ability to be across Nepal, um, I didn't uh, explicitly consider that in, in this, the distribution model. Um, but yes, people have planted them and people do manage groves where they do grow um, in community managed forests typically. Okay, unfortunately, it's time to go. Um, we have a lot of questions here, but for both of you, um, but I just really appreciate both of you speaking with us today and um, you have a lot of folks who enjoyed your talk. Lots of praise here on the chat. Um, so to the audience out there, we will see you next week um, for the LEC and EEPB seminar. Take care. Bye-bye.